Hello, and welcome to Pipe Sizing and Global Collaboration. Today's session um, host is Tom Roberts, who will introduce himself here in a moment. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, CEUs for this event will be marked complete 24 hours after the completion of the event for those interested in obtaining those continuing education units. Um, and then I think Tom has a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started, but I just wanted to make a quick announcement. So I'll hand it off to you, Tom. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, and welcome everyone to the Pipe Sizing and Global Collaboration Learn Live event. Uh, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we won't have any Q&A sessions for this particular presentation just because of the, the variance in time zones and it, it becomes a little bit difficult. Um, uh, we do have the option for any questions to be posed to the ICC and we'll, we'll come back to you for a response and we'll, we'll get to that throughout the presentation. Um, but we do have a number of, of different presenters and unfortunately we won't have a, a panel discussion for this event for those who attended our previous pipe sizing uh, events last week. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, good morning, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, we are recording this event. So if you uh, by any chance didn't get the ability to join live because of the time zone differences across the world, um, you will have the opportunity to view the recording at a later date and share with, with your colleagues who might have missed it. Uh, my name is Tom Roberts. I'm the director of PMG Global with the International Code Council. Uh, so my area of focus is everything to do with plumbing, mechanical, gas fitting uh, across the world and bringing the ICC solutions to different regions, uh, as well as collaborating with different international partners and bringing that expertise to the ICC. Uh, I'm also the chair of, of Standards Australia's WS14 committee uh, that's responsible for the Australian New Zealand Standards for Plumbing and Drainage, the ASNZS 3500 series. Uh, I'm a member of the International uh, Council for Research and Innovation in Buildings uh, and Construction, so the WS062 Commission for Water Supply and Drainage. Uh, I've served as a committee member on multiple ICC committees and for over 10 years uh, I've spent uh, with the Australian Building Codes Board in Australia, writing the, the Plumbing Code of Australia and the Watermark Certification, uh, which is the Australia's Product Certification Scheme. So as a, a disclaimer, uh, this presentation is the copyrighted work of the International Code Council. And, but if you would like to use any of the content, please reach out to us and we can work with you on that. Uh, for CEU credits, uh, please scan the QR code. I'll spend a bit of time with this on the screen, so anyone looking to get the CEU credits can do that. So just to note that the credits are not instantaneous and the process to post them will occur within two weeks of the course. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there'll be a QR code to scan to check out. So we've got a pretty uh, big presentation for everyone today. Uh, we're going to cover a lot of aspects all around pipe sizing, uh, all around global collaboration, uh, and some of the different uh, plumbing requirements and different research initiatives, initiatives that have happened across the world and how they're all coming together through the ICC to come up with a global solution. So I'll cover the factors driving the need for right pipe, the right sizing of pipes. Uh, some of the unintended consequences of the modern flow rates in pipe and current pipe sizes. Uh, I'll then turn to a number of my colleagues from different regions around the world. We've got Gary Klein from the United States, Tom Wise from Australia, Frank Schmidt from Germany, and Ross Wakefield from New Zealand, all presenting on the regional pipe sizing methods and any research that's been done in different areas of the world. Uh, I'll then give an overview of the, how this global collaboration is going uh, towards supporting the development of the International Code Council's 815 standard for pipe sizing. So I'll start by giving a, a high level overview of the many different pipe sizing methods that there are around the world. Uh, this table is compiled by the researchers at the University of Miami that we've partnered with to undertake this body of work. And as you can see with those lists of countries, there is a number of different codes and standards available for use. But you also notice that the, the statistical method used for pipe sizing in those regions uh, varies drastically across the different codes and standards. So you see on the table, there's uh, primarily a probabilistic method, there's imperial 
stochastical and uh, st st stochastic methods as well. So to give you a bit of insight on what that actually means, probabilistic approaches employ an, uh, an approach that is centered around the likelihood of a predicted flow rate being exceeded. So this is often um, role roles around the work completed by Roy Hunter in the early 1940s and typically defines the flow rate as a 99th percentile flow. Uh, I believe we'll come to that in a little bit more detail later on. So the empirical model in water demand generates a mathematical equation based on experimental observed data, and it relates to it the desired parameter or to be predicted or in the case of probable demand, the design flow rate. So a very different approach to the probabilistic. Uh, and the sto stochastic process creates a multiple water demand profiles uh, and that are independent on input parameters obtained by measuring data, allowing the introduction of uncertainty in many of these other models. So very different approaches in different regions. So to focus in on sanitary drainage pipe sizing methods, um, when we look around the world, there are some significant variances in approaches. So we have the, the discharge units. Uh, that is a method primarily used across Europe, a number of European countries. Uh, but interestingly enough, it's also utilised as an alternative method within Australia, and there's an adaptation for that within the Plumbing Code of Australia. There's also drainage fixture units. So again, used in the Australian and New Zealand standards through the 3500 Part 2. Uh, it's also used across the US through the IPC and UPC. Uh, there's also other methods, which, such as the Chinese empirical formula, um, the DS432 in Denmark, which is utilized as a graph for pipe sizing methods, and Chase standard in Japan, which also uses a graph method. So across the world, there's very, very different methods of applying uh, pipe sizing to in plumbing installations. Japan as well. So why do we need proper pipe sizing? You know, what, what's wrong with the way that everyone's doing it today? So there's a number of drivers for pipe sizing and why it's such an important consideration. Uh, and it comes to really comes down to the rate of change within plumbing codes and standards around the world. So the most understood change is the reduction of water usage worldwide. Uh, that impacts water age, drain line carry, and a few other factors. The other element is the height of buildings. So building design has changed significantly over the last 10, 100, uh, 50, 100 years. Uh, and that's presenting challenges to engineers that they need to overcome through system designs. Uh, building designs generally have also changed. So uh, historically, a lot of family dwellings had a one bathroom per dwelling kind of building design. Uh, and that type of architecture has significantly changed in modern years. Uh, and now there's multiple bathrooms across multiple uh, single family homes. So uh, one of the key considerations to that type of change is the probability of a, a particular fixture being used at any one time changes significantly because you've still got the same amount of users in that dwelling, you've just got more bathroom options. And how does that impact on holistic system design? Other consideration is water age and the time it takes to reach a fixture. So with modern energy efficiency considerations, that, that's definitely a, a key part of hot, considering hot water design. Um, and there's also more uh, alternative design and installation practices coming out, such as daisy chain installations that need, need to be considered by modern codes and standards. So why is pipe sizing important? So choosing the correct pipe size is critical as both oversizing and undersizing pipe work can have a significant unintended consequences on the system. So this highlights the importance of looking at pipe sizing of both water services and sanitary plumbing and drainage holistically. It's not necessarily always the case of what, what goes in water-wise comes out sanitary-wise. There's a few influencing factors that happen in between in that system design that need to be considered. So having a holistic approach to it, make sure that all those uh, considerations are in, you know, worked through and um, a solution that covers everything is, is embedded into the standard. So some of the issues being experienced in industry are also sought to be addressed by correct pipe sizing, uh, such as issues of water age, water quality considerations, um, 
impacts of, of different velocities on biofilm generation and distribution, uh, pathogen growth risks. Um, there's also impacts of uh, water velocities resulting in uh, increased rates of hydraulic shock uh, with fast acting solenoid valves or uh, fast acting tapware um, and uh, velocity impacts on erosion and corrosion of pipework and materials. So there's a few things to consider as um, impacts on pipe sizing and why getting it right is such a critical, critical to system design and performance. So water quality is uh, one of those key essential uh, parts of considering pipe sizing. Um, there is a water scarcity issue in most regions of the world in varying degrees. Um, changes in climate are impacting on, on what was established over practices and water availability. Um, and we're seeing significant change in a lot of those areas. Even areas where there's um, there isn't water scarcity issues, there is water quality issues that are trying to be addressed. So water quality is such a big focus and it is a big international focus for uh, a number of agencies at the moment. So in most jurisdictions, water is managed relatively in, in a stringent way through legislation, through codes, through standards. And a lot of emphasis is placed on the quality of the products and materials used. I've included a few different examples of some of those standards that help um, maintain a, a good quality of drinking water through those products and standards in different regions. But what about the system design and how does that impact water quality? So there's a large number of considerations requiring uh, the assessment of the impacts of these changes in pipe sizing. So both for the sanitary plumbing services as well as the water services. But a lot of this research has already been undertaken. So airflow being one cons significant consideration in drain and vent system performance. So uh, maintaining a, a reasonable pressure within the system, both a positive and negative pressure, uh, and having that sufficiently managed throughout the lifetime of the building will avoid avoid any risk of sewer gases entering the building either through bubbling out of the trap seals through a positive pressure system, um, or even a more violent reaction in the especially the lower areas of a large building uh, or even a trap system being depleted from negative system pressures so the air pressures within the sanitary drain systems are su such a significant area of consideration in, in adjusting any of the pipe sizing um, There's been a lot of great work done by primarily the Heriot Watt University, as well as many others around the world, looking into that relationship between uh, drainage flow and the airflow in stacks. So uh, a lot of fantastic research that can be drawn upon already in the development of a new pipe sizing standard. To get an idea of where those pressures are being felt within a building um, and the trap seal is, is the line of defense from sewer gases entering the building, the, the figure primarily on the right shows both uh, on the far right uh, standard stack design, uh, but it also shows on the left the pressures that would be experienced in that particular system design, both the positive and negative and where those impacts are throughout the, the stack system within that building. So it gives you an idea of, of there's different issues to be addressed within uh, different elements of the building. Another issue to be overcome is drain line carry issue. So in the 1940s, uh, when the research was undertaken and the standards uh, were starting to be developed around that research, uh, we had quite significant flush volumes in toilets. We had larger flow rates in, in a lot of the plumbing fixtures uh, and water wasn't as big a consideration. But as we've moved into the modern years, water efficiency standards have driven the reduced uh, use of water through both flow rates of fixtures and flush volumes. So to get an, you know, a visual impact of, of what that would look like within the pipework system, those two first two uh, figures will kind of show that significant reduction in water uh, and in those likely impacts of drain line carry. 
uh, in the future, we're looking to um, potentially have more water scarcity issues and have more uh, innovations available that would uh, reduce the amount of drinking water used. Uh, I guess the, the flow on effects to that would be um, further reductions in the water used within a sanitary drainage system and the further impacts or potential risks in that involved in that. A good example of that is the increased use of grey water and, and black water separation. Uh, by utilising the grey water for other sources, it's a great source of uh, sustainable water use. However, what are the flow on effects and what are the impacts on the sanitary drainage system by further reducing that, that water volume and the water available for drain line carry? To get an idea of uh, peak flow estimates, uh, research was done by Deakin University in Australia, uh, looking at uh, data gathered from a number of different buildings to determine what is the, how close is different standards globally to reality in considering those particular buildings. So to look at the comparison between uh, the codes used in the US, the Australian standards, and even the water demand calculator, it really shows the significant difference in prediction for using these standards on water demand. Uh, physics, and the, there's a lot of variables in there from different regions, um, but it was a, a great indication of, of where the different codes and standards and the different methods utilized by those codes and standards have an impact on pipe sizing. So what are the unintended consequences of modern flow rates on current pipe sizing? So continuing as we are now without change, what are the consequences of that? So from a water, side, uh, water supply perspective, we have issues around water age and the time it takes to get from the water treatment plant or the, the property boundary to the tap and actually being utilised within that building. Um, decreased velocities. So we, we're designing for... Uh, systems that used to utilise a lot more water through the water efficiency reductions and water usage, those velocities have dropped quite significantly. What, what are the impacts on that? Um, the disinfection and the many different ways of going about that um, really comes into play when you have areas around the world that utilise chlorination as a dis disinfection method. And that, that residual chlorine may not actually achieve its intended result with the water age issues that might come about in a particular design or a particular region. Uh, and energy use, and energy is such a big topic at the moment, everyone's scrambling it's, uh, to, to achieve um, energy efficiency, but plumbing system designs are a, a significant component to that and having uh, better designs and more accurate pipe sizing as the flow and effects of having uh, in a reduction in energy usage. And the other side to that is sanitary drainage. So uh, I've mentioned shallow water depths and issues around drain line carry, uh, increasing the likelihood of blockage due to that uh, waste stranding issues and sanitary ventilation, which is, uh, I guess, a key consideration in avoiding uh, uh, any sort of positive or negative pressures in excess of, of what the system can handle and those risks around uh, sewer gases escaping into the building and causing um, risks of pathogen, pathogen spread. So with all those considerations and kind of the, the introduction of why pipe sizing is so important and why there's so many key elements in considering pipe sizing, uh, what we're going to do is, is invite some of our key presenters today to talk through what's um, the, the pipe sizing methods utilised in different regions, any research that's been done in that area. And I guess that will highlight the, the ability for global cl collaboration to bring a lot of those pieces of the puzzle, a lot of that international research, and a lot of that experience that's been gained in delving into different problems and subject matters and pulling that together through the, through the ICC and through the 815 standard to come up with a solution you can see through some of those unintended consequences, it's not one of those problems that can really be solved on your own. It's one of those things that's got to be worked on collaboratively and there's got to be um, draw from all that expertise around the world to, to make that happen. So we've got 
a number of presenters today. We've got Gary Klein from the US, Tom Wise from Australia, Frank Schmidt from Germany, and Ross Wakefield, all presenting from uh, on the pipe sizing methods, the codes and standards of their region, uh, as well as any research that's been done, which would be a key contributor to the, you know, as a piece of the puzzle to the whole pipe sizing equation. So firstly, I'd like to invite Gary to, to present from the United States. So Gary is, is the president of Klein, Gary Klein and Associates. Uh, Gary is actually a chair of the ICC 815 standard for sizing and distribute, sizing water and distribution and sanitary drainage and vent piping systems. So Gary has been heavily involved in energy efficiency and renewable energy since 1974. And since the early 1990s, he's led the effort to incorporate hot water as a system into the core principles of building sites. Uh, after serving 19 years of the California Energy Commission, he has provided consulting on sustainability since 2008 and, and an emphasis on the water, energy, carbon, health connection. So thanks for joining us, Gary, and, and uh, great to have your leadership on the development of the uh, ICC 815 standard as well. Thank you, Tom. Well, let's get started. Next slide. Uh, yeah. um, thank you. So I want to go back a little bit in history. Uh, we've had codes and standards related to water in the United States for quite a while. Some of you may recognize a couple of our past presidents. Um, and in 1921, Herbert Hoover, uh, who was then Secretary of Commerce, uh, wanted everybody to have indoor plumbing and electricity in every home. Lots of effort went into that. And at the time, less than 1% of all homes in the US had indoor plumbing. Next. The Hoover Codes, BH13, uh, recommended minimum requirements for plumbing. There were an extensive set of codes, but the key is the middle sentence. Uh, in, they included recommended sizing of all three plumbing systems, supply, venting, and sanitary drainage, allowable materials, slopes, installation of fixtures, room venting, maximum lengths, et cetera. And we are living with that effort today all around the world. People have copied a lot of that all around the world to figure out what to do. Next, please. Oh. Let's jump ahead to the 1940s. Uh, as Tom mentioned, there's this fellow named Roy Hunter, who was a National Bureau of Standards researcher at the time. That group, National Bureau of Standards, is now called NIST. Um, I think that change happened somewhere in the 60s or 70s. Um, in any event, uh, the, he developed peak demand curves for water supply, which are still in use today in the United States. They are the basis of both of our model plumbing codes and all the state plumbing codes. They're separately developed. Uh, for those of you who have only one plumbing code in your, your jurisdiction, uh, we too are confused why there are at least two plumbing codes in the United States. There ought to be one because the physics ought to be the same, but you know that's a whole different matter. Um, so it, he developed this method using very limited information about water use in buildings. And at the time, as Tom alluded to earlier, um, there were very few bathrooms in most buildings. It wasn't uncommon for people on a floor of an apartment building to have one bathroom for the floor. A house probably only had one bathroom if it had any. Indoor plumbing was still in the 40s. It had grown rather dramatically, but still new to a lot of people. Um, I lived in a house that was built in the 1850s, and I'm sure it didn't come with indoor plumbing. And what was added when I lived there in the 70s was shoehorned into various spots in the house, kitchen downstairs and the first floor, which is where it was originally. There was a bathroom on the first floor, bathroom on the second floor, and that was about it. And probably five or six people lived in that house. So it wasn't uncommon that people had to wait to use bathrooms. And that's the key to understanding what Roy Hunter developed uh, for the Hunter's curve method. He looked around and tried to figure out what the probability of the next fixture being used would be and how much it might overlap other fixtures in use. And that's the key to the, the whole idea of the, the method of water supply fixture units. Um, 
how much water and what's the probability would it be used at a given simultaneous point in time? Um, the maximum probability of the next fixture being used is one. There's a line. Think about stadiums and such like that or uh, theaters at intermission. There's a line going out the door when you get off an airplane. All the people getting out of the plane want to rush to the bathrooms and there's a line. That doesn't happen in most buildings most of the time. Yet our plumbing codes are based on that assumption. Next slide, please. This is a copy of the front page of the, the cover of the book that he wrote in the 1940s. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a fixture unit discussion here, uh, and it's a unit of measure that estimates the water load that a fixture would put on a plumbing system based on its flow rate and frequency of use. And the combination of those two becomes a water supply fixture unit, and a similar method was used to get drainage fixture units on the, on the outgoing side. Um, I've never seen any units for the airflow because we don't seem to manage that particularly well. It's a consequence of thing, water moving that you end up with airflow also moving. Um, and the work from Harriet Watt is very interesting. I hope someone else is going to cover a bit of that. Um, it was surprising to me to see what the percentages were when we visited the, the testing tower last year. Next slide, please. This is an image of the graph that he developed. He created two different curves, although at some point in time they collapse into one. One curve was for uh, the flush tank toilets and the other was for flushometer toilets. And uh, as you can see past, I think it's a thousand fixture units, which is a huge number of fixture units for most buildings. Um, the two curves collapsed into one. The next slide. So we're going to cover the methods used in the U.S. for developing uh, water supply, sanitary drainage, and venting methods here in the U.S. The next slide, please. First, um, we're in water supply. This is the International Plumbing Code. And this is a really interesting feature of this code. Uh, this section 604.1 says the design of the water distribution system shall conform to accepted engineering practice, which is an italics, which means it's a defined term, and methods used to determine pipe sizes shall be approved. An accepted engineering practice, that which conforms to accepted principles, tests, or standards of nationally recognized technical or scientific authorities. So in the plumbing codes in the United States, chapter six says, this is what you shall do. And in some cases, what you shall do be, can be asked for to be used in, in one of the appendix appendices, in this case, Appendix E, which is what engineers would tend to use to design a building as opposed to, you just want a rough and ready thing that you're sure will work, you use chapter six. The next slide. Same idea for a different code, right? Same section of the chapter that's relevant um, and it says in 610.4, systems within the range of table 610 shall be permitted to be sized from that table or by the method in accordance with 610.5. And 610.5 says, except as provided by the previous section, you can use appendices A and C for alternate methods of sizing. Um, and the alternate methods include appendix A, which is the engineering rules equivalent to appendix E in the IPC. It doesn't give engineers a choice. There's no accepted engineering practice option. You shall use one of these methods, different code, different rules. Next. All right, so now we're looking at sanitary drainage. Um, the maximum fixture unit load, um, it's, the maximum number of drainage fixture units attack connect to a given size of building sewer, building drain, or horizontal branch of the building system shall be used table 710.1 parens one. The maximum number of drainage fixture units connected to a given size horizontal branch or vertical soil or waste stack shall be determined using table 710.1 parens two. These two tables govern the method. I'm not aware of anything in this in the IPC, or in fact, in the UPC, uh, that gives you optional 
methods and the appendices for drainage piping system performance. Next. And you will see that it's sort of the same thing. Oh, we have a method in Appendix C that allows you to do an alternate method of drainage pipe sizing using Appendix C. It's not a very commonly used appendix, um, at least not to my knowledge. Uh, so you have a number of drainage fixture units, number of fixtures allowed to be connected on a stack. You must follow the rules in the table. Um, and you have certain maximum lengths, all of which show up in the table. The next slide, please. Sanitary venting. It's based on approximate method and assume relationships to the drainage flow. It does not take into account in the United States research that was done um, from Harriet Watt. It's all based on the original theory work that was done by the National Bureau of Standards roughly around 1940. Next. And there is stuff on the size of the vent stacks, um, the minimum required diameter of the stack vents will be determined from the developed length and the total of drainage fixture units in accordance with table 906.1. But in no case shall it be less than one half the diameter of the drain served or less than one and a quarter inches. So it says that the vent stack could be half of the diameter of the drain stack. Um, and I guess what we've learned from the research at Harriet Watt is that that's not the best way to size the vent stack. Next. And this is showing a table for sanitary venting methods in the International Plumbing Code. Next, please. And here's a table from the Uniform Plumbing Code. Again, similar, it's lengths and diameters and number of fixture units that can be attached to it. Keep moving on this one. This is very similar to a slide that Tom showed earlier. Um, uh, he added some more about water quality and venting and things like that. Um, the key is that things have changed. Our rules in the United States are based on research that was done in the 30s and published in the 40s. Nothing flushes or flows at those rates anymore. Why didn't we do something to change pipe size? Um, next slide, please. This table um, comes from a research report that was done, published on the the Plumbing Engineering Research Coalition's report on drain line carry, uh, one of the, the two, the PERC one, so the first of two tests that were done on that question here in the US, there was a similar test done in Australia. Um, and what's really interesting to me is the second most important variable was the slope of the drain pipe, um, not the diameter, the slope. But what's very interesting to me in this is that the volume of water used or the flush rates of water used, it's really the, the, the rates of use, not the total quantities. Um, the rates of use have gone down by a minimum of 49% since 1980. Forget 1940, uh, because prior to 19, uh, well, prior to the 1990s, flow rates for shower heads, faucets, toilets and urinals, flush items are the last two, were not regulated in the United States. They were the choice of manufacturers and other conditions, but they, they, you know, that's the way it was. It wasn't a regulation. I was working for the California Energy Commission in the 1990s when the federal government established what's here in the table in the middle, uh, the EPAC 1992 requirements, which took effect probably around 1995 um, for flush volumes. Uh, and the, the first ones for flush volumes and, and flow rates, flush volumes for toilets and urinals and flow rates for faucets and shower heads. And those rules went into effect. The person who was working at NIST that would have been the Roy Hunter of his era had retired before the federal government in the United States made this rule in EPAC. 
And I remember sitting in the room by, with people at the California Energy Commission who were so excited about seeing flow rates and flush volumes reduced because that would be a good thing for water conservation, some for energy use. And we never did a systems check. Didn't come up. No one thought to look at the unintended consequences of this decision while the, the, the decision was being made and implemented. And we are now working backwards to catch up with that lack of foresight that all of us who've been working in the field at that point have been doing work in, the, in this field for, for at least 20 years by that, state, that point in time, we should have known better. The systems approach to things is essential when you're working out with various different components. And this just shows you the importance of paying attention as flow rates change, flush volumes change. And as best I can tell in the US, they are unlikely to go back up again. Next slide, please. Um, so water quality in the U.S. is governed by two sorts of rules. One is the Safe Water Drinking Act of 1974 and the NSF, uh, ANSI, and uh, the, Ca the Canadian Standard uh, 61 for drinking water components uh, was established in 89 um, for this standard. So they both affect water quality in the US. One, the first one says the wa all waters actually designed for drinking or potentially used for drinking use, whether from above or underground sources. Um, and the second one talks about, uh, is it safe to drink for the, was it loose through the plumbing materials in our buildings? Uh, the component safe is the water that's in the pipes. If the water in the pipe safe is the first question, Second question is, are the materials used to transport it safe for water as well? Uh, this is where we don't allow lead in our plumbing anymore. Uh, those rules come under a, a, the NSF 61 rules. Next slide, please. So we've talked about these changes to plumbing and the water quality implications of it, I want to point out the black dots near the x-axis. These are measured 99th percentile peak flow rates in 20 different apartment buildings in the United States, ranging in size on the left from eight apartments to the right, 384 apartments in the building being served by the same system. Um, since I work a lot in the energy world, this is the hot water piping networks for the building, not the entire building. The people I work with have been doing a lot of studies on water heating systems. And so they were able to get us data on peak water use for the hot water systems in their buildings. And the math is the same, whether it's fundamentally the same math for probability, whether it's hot side or cold side. Um, and so all that we were able to use the methods. But the black dots are the measured 99th percentile peak. Remember that means 1% of the time, the flows are higher than this. 99% of the time they're equal or less than this. Notice the red crosses at the top and the orange crosses slightly below them. Those are the, the estimated peak flow rates from the two major plumbing codes in the United States. Appendix A is uh, the uniform plumbing code. It says CPC because California adopts uh, the, the uniform plumbing code into the California plumbing code for the most part. And the IPC Appendix E design is the orange crosses. The blue crosses are the water demand calculator estimates that come from using uh, what's known as in the California plumbing code or the uniform plumbing code as Appendix M. It's a new method of right sizing that was developed uh, starting about in 2010, first published in 2017 for right sizing the plumbing, the supply piping in residential applications, meaning single family dwellings, apartments and apartment buildings. The plumbing code that we use in California, the CPC Appendix A design, overestimates the measured peak by more than, more than 10 times, on average 13 times with a variation of five to 27 times of an overestimate. The water demand calculator only overestimates mostly by a factor of two to four, with the exception of the last, the last building on the right, for some reason that's six times, and I haven't figured out why exactly yet. Next slide, please.
I have two friends that we've been working with over the last several years to try and figure out what's going on in the plumbing in the United States. Uh, my friend Pete from upstate New York uh, has flow meters, which is really rare in our industry for reasons that escape me. People don't seem to want to actually measure things. They want to estimate things because that's all we've ever done. Pete had flow meters. And he says, if the flows are so low, why are the pipes so big? It's a fair question. He was measuring a 35-unit apartment building. Could you go back one slide, please? If you could point to G in the middle of the list. Thank you. There we go. G. Pete was working in, in a building in that complex. This is a two, six building apartment complex, 35 unit apartments, 35 units in each apartment building. And the main line going into that building was three inches. And the hot water line was over, it was a two or two and a half inch main coming out of the mechanical room. Pete never measured more than three gallons per minute for the whole building. If you only have three gallons a minute, why do you have a two and a half inch pipe? It makes no sense. Right, that's just something's crazy about that mathematics. Well, it, the rules were written down in 1940. Nothing flushes or flows at those rates. Next slide. And there's another fellow I work with, Todd Kukta out of Cal uh, San Francisco. And he says, if the peak flow rate's only 20 gallons a minute, why are the drain size for 200 gallons a minute? Now, there's a time delay between what comes in and what goes out, but Fundamentally, what goes out can't be a whole lot different than what comes in, unless, of course, you're doing things to change it, as Tom was suggesting, by diverting flows in the drain system for other purposes. All that's going to do is make the sanitary drainage smaller, not bigger. We have to work on this. That's why I'm uh, excited for the work of the 815 committee, um, and we have a lot of work to do to look at the whole system in, these bu in our buildings as, a, as, a, as one unit. Next slide. And I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Gary. It's uh, really interesting to hear the, the differences in the U.S. and where all this uh, has come from, because I think there's, there's, it's not only the U.S. that's utilized some of that early stage research. I think everyone across different regions have, has kind of jumped on that. But as I said, there hasn't been a lot of work since. There's, it's only been in recent years where a lot of uh, academics have started to delve into this particular problem. So great to have that uh, early background. And thanks again, Gary. I think we're in you're safe hands welcome. with your leadership with 815. Thank you, Tom. So now I'd like to hand over to Tom Wise from Australia. So Tom, Tom's the Technical Director of Fire and Hydraulics uh, with Warren Smith Consulting Engineers. Uh, Tom's studied building services engineering as well as completed a specialist qualification in plumbing engineering. Uh, Tom's specialty is healthcare, the healthcare sector uh, for hydraulic services and has been working there since 2010. Uh, Tom sits on a number of committees for international standards, including the ICC's 815 standard, uh, but he's also involved in many committees and working groups uh, advising industry and government within Australia. Uh, Tom's accredited for plumbing certif certification across many of the states of Australia. Uh, and with his expertise in healthcare buildings, he's also a member of the Association of Fire Safety for Australia and New Zealand. So I'll hand over to you, Mr. Wise, to, to talk us through the uh, Australian region. Thanks, Tom. And thanks to the ICC for having me. I just jump to the next slide, please. So I'd just like to start by running everybody through um, the legislative sort of structure within Australia. So each state and territory um, have their own acts and regulation that pertain to building and plumbing. Um, these then give way to, uh, to legislating the National Construction Code, uh, which is a series of, um, of three volumes, uh, one being the building code for um, all um, buildings except for class one, um, the second being the class one building code, which is domestic buildings, and the third being the um the plumbing code of Australia. Uh, those documents then um 
provide provision for reference documents, which include Australian standard. Uh, so these make Australian standards and other documents that are referenced by these the codes um, legislative documents. Um, the building code and plumbing code is a performance-based code. So compliance level is set at a performance uh, at the performance requirement level, which gives great a great degree of flexibility to practitioners and um, and designers out there to either choose a deemed to satisfy pathway, which is following those uh, uh, reference documents like an Australian standard or potentially an international standard if the um, if the code so reference, or producing a performance based solution. Next slide, Tom. <clears throat> so a performance-based solution is basically for a complex building or where the deemed to satisfy provisions don't really make um, adequate allowance for. So you could think about it as employing a, um, a chef to bake your birthday cake rather than a deemed to satisfy um, uh, solution is a fairly complex, uh, sorry, uh, simple, uh, easy to follow, not dissimilar to a, um, a packet cake recipe in the same analogy. Next slide, Tom. So um, the Australian Building Codes Board, uh, who are the author of the, um, the Plumbing Code of Australia, have been working pretty hard over the last few years to start to um, put uh, metrics that are quantifiable against our performance requirements. And there's been some big changes between the 2019 Plumbing Code of Australia and the 2022. Um, here's some good examples. Maybe uh, the, the velocity one, originally set out to sort of identify that pressures and flows must be um, enabled for the correct functioning of the fixtures. Now, that's very hard to measure with a ruler or a tape measure or the like, whereas um, the new quantified requirement makes reference to a maximum velocity, um, a percentage of the duration that um, that 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 velocity might be breached, um, setting some parameters that designers can uh, measure and actually work to. Uh, the same could be said about pressure as well. So we'll we'll jump to the next slide, please. Uh, so the first part of my discussion is on water services, and then we'll talk to um, some wastewater services. So I might start with my journey. So I, I got back from the UK um, in 2010 and commenced sort of working uh, using the DIN 1988-300 to estimate 99th percentiles for healthcare uh, wards that I was working on. I met a person called Nick Soden uh, around 2012, um, and at that time he was involved in the industry body. I had a bit of a discussion about um, peak flows and 99th percentiles, and by the end of the discussion, he thought I was pretty mad. <laughs> We're actually really good friends nowadays. Um, late 2012, Nick took a trip to Western Australia where he met Phil Woolhouse, who works at the other end of the problem, uh, fixing cyclic pressures due to oversized pressure reduction valves and backflow prevention devices uh, throughout a, a good portion of Australia. In late um, 2013, I undertook some analysis on um, gathered data for hospitals and compared that against the DIN-3 um, and the DIN-300, uh, which had just come out the year before. It was quite amazing how, um, how closely that data aligned to the Dash 300, which was the, the newer empirical data from um, Germany. Over the years, Nick and I started to align our, our ideas and um, our company employed a graduate. Um, Nick convinced me to join the industry body and, we, and he sort of commenced a bit for, of, of further data gathering. Uh, we then formed the Water Demand Subcommittee, um, headed up by uh, by Johnny. Now we sort of pumble on to the industry pathway. So the ABCB sort of started in 2015 um, with a report. You can find that on the ABCB's website. We then sort of hashed through a little bit as to what Nick, Nick got up to. Um, then uh, after starting that, Deakin University, who were um, who were looking um, at some research uh, assignments, uh, sorry, research papers, stumbled across our website um, and reached out. From there, we formed a relationship, which has been really, really good for um, the HCAA. 
Um, the ABCB held a, um, a water monitoring um, industry roundtable where there were some good, robust ideas and discussion from all parts of industry um, and international as well. Four residential sites were chosen um, to sort of inform the uh, the, the Deakin uh, research. Deakin's published a fair few papers, and this year, um, Josie or Brennan Josie from Deakin um, published an online calculator that determines the 99th percentile for residential buildings uh, customised for Australia and New Zealand conditions. So that was a pretty um, exciting outcome. The journey is definitely not over, but that's a little bit of a summary where um, we've gone so far. Next slide, please, Tom. <clears throat> This is a great graphical representation of the four buildings that have had um, four years of data observed, um, probably about two years each building due to some dropouts from time to time. It compares the current um, ASNZS 3500.1 deemed to satisfy provision calculation, which is a big red um, bar, and then the, um, the corrected data, which has been adjusted um, based on the granular granularity of the grabs. Um, being the um, the the yellowy cheese looking one. So as you can see, um, there's a gross overestimation that our current deemed to satisfy provisions provides for residential buildings. I should also note that um, the 99th percentile in most of these buildings was um, observed for about a minute over the over the four year period. Next slide, please, Tom. So to what degree um, is it overestimated, underestimated? Um, you can see here that this is a percentage of um, ASNZS 3500.1 uh, that was actually observed. So um, there's real gross overestimation happening. Next one, Tom. Uh, Lynn Jack from Harriet Watt. Now put this very handy table together, or, or graph, I should say, identifying different standards from around the world. Uh, you can sort of see that the Australian standard sits probably mid-tier, and therefore there's a lot of additional overestimation happening um, around the world. Next one, Tom, please. In Australia, in, in, in Sydney specifically, it's been quite interesting to actually look at um, the water usage trend versus uh, the estimated population increase. So this graph here, um, the dots, the black black dotted line, or oh, well dashed line up the top, and the um, and the solid orange line, um, identify population growth going up whilst um, water usage um, decreasing. It also identifies um, where water restrictions were brought on within Sydney. It's quite interesting to think um, how the mindset of people really grossly changes um, the, the usage of water, given that this lucky network utility operator probably got a good deal um, of additional life out of their um, existing infrastructure at some point in time. Next slide, Tom. So when it comes to the compliance pathway uh, via the performance requirement, um, it, it represents a simple equation of um, once determining the 99th percentile, um, you can use your area flow uh, to then determine your velocity for compliance. Next one, Tom. So the real question that sits out there is, what does failure look like? We talk to the 99th percentile and um, and and degree and that determines a degree of failure. But does it deal with too hot, too much pressure, too cold, not enough pressure? Is the temperature fluctuation plus minus 0.1 um, of a degree Celsius acceptable? Is a pressure fluctuation plus minus 0.1 of a KPA acceptable? And what's the duration of change um, leading to dis discomfort? All these questions are probably questions that the world needs to reflect upon when we relook at um, our definition of, of failure and what is acceptable. Next one, Tom. So 
I sort of reflect upon um, the Goldilocks story and the porridge and the beds and the chairs, because really that's the first quest, one of the first questions that we need to answer together. So is the 99th percentile the correct choice um, for designing to? Next slide. So here's some data from one of Josie's buildings um, that was monitored. As you can see, bottom right, the 99th percentile was uh, 4.8 circa uh, litres per second. And that was observed for um, less than a minute for this four years worth of data captured here. Uh, I've sort of highlighted poorly in red there, uh, the, the greater flows. And so these sit within um, the 20th percentile and, and lower. So the majority of the, the time, the building sees a flow rate less than 80% of the peak 99th that we're all designing to at current. Next slide, Tom. So I had a bit of a brainstorm and listed out the 78 different components that I could identify in a heated water system, for instance. And then I wrote next to them, which um, I, I thought should be designed to the 99th, which should be designed to the average flow, so less than the 20th, um, which should be determined based on heat loss, peak hour, peak usage, average usage, and then there was just a miscellaneous category. So still 40% of components seem to um, trump up at the 99th, but then there's a great deal of components that actually don't need to, don't actually follow the 99th approach when it comes to um, flow determination. So what can go wrong with actually overestimating your 99th is the issue with water hygiene. So that leads to water age because you're using a lot less water than what's ex what was expected. And um, in turn, if you have overestimated, you've got a greater surface area for microbial growth and also a lot more water within the system due to oversized pipes, oversized tanks and other pieces of equipment um, that isn't adequately being turned over. Hygienic velocities are another issue. Um, so hygienic velocities, as sort of demonstrated by a slide a little bit earlier on, um, in the instance of that residential building, uh, hygienic velocities were next to never um, actually obtained within the system due to the oversizing. So a couple of years ago um, at the ABCB's Water Monitoring Industry Roundtable, um, there was an idea thrown out there um, for des designing to the average flow, um, sizing to the average, but stretching the material velocity for the 99th. So that might be picking the be best, best velocity that um, 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 industry might recommend and then stretching it to that, that upper limit. So I think this is something that industry could definitely explore worldwide when it comes to reinventing how we size pipes and other pieces of equipment. Next slide, Tom. So how can we as a world start to solve this problem? Data is really key here and sharing the world's data is something that we need to start doing. Um, to do that, we really need to create and utilize data sets with common def definitions and therefore provide classifications for the reliability of the data set, high quality, low quality, medium quality. A centralized data um, base would be a very handy way for people to self-service and go and obtain data for their research and to better inform what they might be doing in their country. Next one, Tom. So jumping across to wastewater services. Most of the research conducted to date in Australia on waste, wastewater, uh, wastewater um, has been for the sanitary plumbing system, which in Australia is defined as the vertical stacks and vents 
that serve floor levels um, more often than not greater than three above um, the ground floor. The quantification um, has led to um, better definition around the plus minus 375 pastels um, for the uh, for the determined flow rate within the system. Adoption and determination of flow rate um, has looked towards um, Ian 12056.2. If we jump to the next slide, Tom. But like many things, not not all aspects of a standard or document um, can be can be directly applied internationally. So um, in Australia, there's been uh, some uh, some uh, research into the actual K factors used and um, the potential to adjust the K factor to suit the local arrangements. Next one, Tom. This obviously um, gives consideration to the intervals between fixed usage over the average peak and then um, leans towards a K factor, which in turn um, has looked at different types of buildings, uh, which aligns with our building code classifications um, in Australia. Uh, next one, Tom. So in wrapping up, I'd like to acknowledge the um, the great work that uh, a lot of people have done and the time that they've given, uh, but not limited to the people and uh, um, industry bodies on the screen. And then for the next slide, there's some really good papers uh, written by Josie um, and and others. I'd encourage people to have a read of these. There's also great papers um, available on the Australian Building Codes Board website, uh, some of the preliminary sort of research and um, intent. And then of course, um, Lynn Jack is also another great um, author of, of many papers uh, as to the same topics. If you'd like to check out waterdemand.com.au, um, on this website, you'll find uh, some of the background of, of what we've been doing in Australia, plus all the years of data that we've kept, that we've um, gathered for the four residential buildings, plus um, the additional healthcare buildings that are about to load on there or start logging. It's all free. Uh, you do have to drop an email to the um, to to gain an account, but it's it's all yours to to use and enjoy. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Tom. Uh, really great insight into what's been uh, happening here in Australia and telling a bit of the, the story of the journey of how it all happened, I think really paint, paints the picture. And I think a lot of different regions will probably have the same reflections of uh, people coming up against these issues and trying to solve these problems as, as a country. Absolutely. And I mean, the, I look forward to the, 815 working groups because it gives a good global um, opportunity to uh, to solve problems together. Oh, well, thanks again for joining us, Tom, um, all the way from Canada, representing Australia. Um, but glad, glad we were able to catch you for this presentation. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Tom. All right, I'd like to invite Michael Schmidt as our next presenter. So, uh, sorry, Frank Schmidt, sorry. Uh, Frank is an international market developer at Kemper. Uh, Frank's been in the plumbing industry for more than 28 years and started his career as a certified plumber. So happy World Plumbing Day for yesterday, Frank. A uh, very important day. Um, he's later studied uh, building technology and technical management at the University of Munster in Gen Germany. Uh, Frank's passion is to share plumbing design experience on the international markets and to lean, learn about plumbing design installation solutions from other countries. Uh, in the past 14 years, Frank's uh, supported many plumbing installation projects worldwide and presented seminars in more than 15 countries. So I'll hand over to you now, Frank, and hopefully we can add a few more countries through this webinar to your list. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for the good introduction. Uh, yeah, my topic today is the introduction of the German domestic water sizing methodology. 
And Tom, I think that's starting on the next slide. Yes, that's uh, the front screen, of course. Uh, this shows just a little screenshot from the software that we are using that's based on everything that I'm telling you uh, within the next minutes. So next slide, Tom, please. The history of the German pipe sizing standards starts in um, the 1913. So I think, Tom, if you just press yeah, okay, that the first um, publication was in 1913 from the TVR Wasser, which is nowadays the DVGW. Uh, the DVGW nowadays is the accreditation for the plumbing material in Germany. And at that time, they made the first publication of the first regulations for water installations. So in 1930, then we got the first edition of the DIN 1988. So at that time, it was uh, two several two separate um, standards, similar to uh, what you what what um, Gary Klein experienced uh, in the US. In 1940, the DIN 1988, the second edition, then included the TVR Wasser. So that was the end of the parallel uh, regulation in Germany. Third edition in 1955, that was where uh, the first measures against uncontrolled cold, cold water heat gain and operation interruptions have been included. And a few years later, seven years later, they revised the uh, uh, 1988 again to the fourth edition and took on board regulations for water treatment and uh, against backflow uh, for backflow prevention. This lasted then a little bit longer, 20, 26 years. So in 1988, we got the fifth edition. That was a little bit more work. That was a complete revision of the eight parts. We got pipe sizing based on flow rates. In the past, we had the loading units as well. So the loading units were, um, sub were substituted by real flow rates. In 1989, then we got the European standards or the European CEN TC164 Working Group 2. So that was the foundation for European uh, regulation. And in 1997, so um, eight years after, they uh, came to an agreement for an European standard EN806, the parts one to five as a package. And then there was a transition time for the countries to adopt to this European standard and add um, their national appendix. And in 2012, so this transition period was over. So we got the EN806 part one to five with the national appendix D1988 with the packages 100 to 600. Next slide, please. Yeah, a little bit basics about the standard that we have now since 2012. So as I said, the loading units were um, uh, yeah, taken out, eliminated, and now we're calculating based on flow rates of fixtures. Uh, one of the guys uh, who were writing this standard, Mr. Klaus Rudert, uh, his, one of the arguments was uh, other sectors of MEP don't use equivalents to loading units. There are no heat units in uh, or air units in HVAC. So his uh, um, opinion is that loading units do not simplify the sizing process. That's basically why uh, that was eliminated and we are now um, calculating with flow rates. So no flow without pressure. We have uh, for every fixture that we have for showers, toilets, wash and basins, there's a specific standard minimum flow pressure or dynamic pressure. And the av available pressure gradient is uh, also a major factor for pipe sizing. The available pressure gradient will be explained in one of the further slides as well. Then the EN uh, 806 part three, this method is limited only for residential buildings because it contains a simplified or for standard installations only method and the special installations should be calculated with national differentiated methods. So that's where the national appendix of the D1988 came into uh, effect. Then, uh, yeah, just there were two more points. <laughs> Research showed that the simultaneous use curves are not practical. So that in nine, uh, from, from the EN806, 
So the 1988 contains different curves for different buildings, um, for hotels, hospitals, etc. And the use of project-specific room books for determination of simultaneous uh, use is given. So if you have a hotel or any, any project, basically, you should speak to the client how the usage uh, will become uh, or yeah, what will be realistic in for, for this building. Then the EN 806 part three does also not contain methods for hot water return pipe sizing. And that is also explained in the D1988 part 300. So hot water return pipe sizing, hydraulic balancing is also included. Tom, now next slide, please. Yeah, that's the setup for Germany then. So we have the EN806 part three, simplified method, and then the EN806 part three with a differentiated method. And the simplified method is only usable for sizing cold and hot water supply pipes of residential buildings with maximum six apartments. When the, and also uh, additional requirement, and only then if um, the maintenance of drinking water hygiene and sufficient supply pressure has been ensured. So that that's a request for the water supply, water supplier, what's the supply pressure, and then you might use this um, simplified method uh, when the other two factors, so residential buildings with six apartments is also um, valid. All right, next one. Yeah, these general design requirements for uh, from our design standard. Uh, most important is drinking water hygiene requirements. We want to supply uh, healthy water and want, do not want to harm uh, anyone who's using the water from these installations. Uh, another point is that uh, the, the water content should be uh, minimized. Uh, as less water content as possible in a pipe surface is minimized. Um, I mean, Tom mentioned that before as well. So that's the same idea, hot water temperature should not fall below 55 degrees uh, C, 131 degree F, at any point in the hot water pipe work. Exception, we have a single supply and floor distribution pipe of maximum three liter water content. But that's only um, yeah, a, a maximum limit. It's allowed, but that is not regarded as, as good practice. So especially in healthcare facilities, the requirement is um, to reduce this to a minimum um, yeah, best would be zero. Then we have the regulation that uh, 30 seconds after opening an outlet, cold water temperature must not be higher than 25 degrees C. Uh, that's yeah, also based on the VDI um, standard, VDI 6023. There is a definition of also comfort classes. So the less waiting time, the higher the comfort class of your installation. So if you have instant hot water, it's a comfort class um, three. So three is the best class, one is the lowest class. Uh, and the last one is that um, branching should be minimized to keep the installation as simple as possible. Of course, sometimes um, hydraulically or technically uh, branching is a must, um, but that's basically, um, yeah, minimize it and just use as much as you require. Next slide, please. First of all, when we start the pipe sizing, we need to define the flow paths and the pipe sections. A flow path is, for example, here indicated in yellow and the beginning in, in blue, which is uh, from the incoming uh, water main going through the hot water heater in the plant room and then, for example, all the way up to the hot water connection of this uh, combination there, dishwasher and sink. That is a flow path. Um, and the pipe section or a flow path um, is uh, existing out of several um, pipe sections. And the pipe section has a constant flow and diameter. So considering this a new pipe section, um, always starts as a T-piece or a reduction of a pipework. Next slide, please. As a second step, we need to determine the, the flow rates. So after specifying the flow paths and pipe sections, the design flow rates of every fixtures must be determined. Um, this should be done with specific values from the manufacturers of the outlets, if possible, if they are available. 
most of the time at the beginning um, they are not yet uh, yeah not yet clear if if it's not decided what fixture you you want to install later on the values given in the table of the dean 198 are therefore reference uh, values and the further des the design stage the more important it is to use the real values from the manufacturer if the de design flow rates <clears throat> given by the manufacturer of the fixture is lower than the dean value it is recommended to use the lower values. This must be agreed with the client then, of course. And if the design flow rate of the fixture, um, the manufacturer is higher than the ones in the Dean, the higher values must be used for calculation. This is very common for this rain dance showers, for example, as this showers usually uh, also require a higher minimum supply pressure as the standard showers. Okay, next one. Then the design flow rates um, are accumulated to a total design flow rate in every pipe section. So here you see we have a shower, we have a um, toilet, we have a wash hand basin with a specific cold water design flow rates. Most of the time, if you have the shower here, you have 0.15 liters per second for the cold water connection and you have 0.15 liters per second at the hot water um, pipe size. And yeah, toilet is only cold water. And at the wash hand basin, you have then 0 0.07 liters per second for cold water and the same on the hot water. This values therefore only show the cold water values. So accumulated to a total, this bathroom would have an accumulated design flow rate of 0.35 liters per second. Next slide, please. The exceptions. So um, because of um, yeah, simultaneous use reasons in one bathroom, we call, let's call it plumbing unit. We call it Nutzungseinheit. That's a special term in our, in our standard. So um, there are exceptions of adding up the design flow rates that can be made for plumbing units in residential buildings or when the usage is similar to a plumbing unit in residential buildings. So for example, a guest room in a hotel, um, a patient uh, bathroom in a hospital, something like that. So a plumbing unit is usually um, also then, yeah, also a kitchen is a plumbing unit and you can um, take out the design unit of a urinal, for example, when there is a WC. And the second exception is the second wash hand basin can, must not be considered if you have two wash hand basins. Um, the next one is uh, if you have a shower and a bath, you just take into account the design flow rate of the fixture with the higher design flow rate. So most of the time that's the bath. So you don't need to take the shower into account. Um, and the last and the fourth one is the tap in front of toilet areas. So for cleaning purpose, um, they are also not considered. Next slide, please. Yeah, then after adding up all the design flow rates, um, we have to convert the total design flow rate into peak flow. And therefore, um, yeah, the D1988 contains functions to convert the total design flow rate into an expected peak flow. The conversion takes the simultaneous use of the fixtures into account. The functions from the DIN are based on empiric data from consumption measurements conducted in existing buildings in Germany around uh, 1980s. And this is different to the design calculations in, in many countries, as far as I know. Um, where the simultaneous use is taken into account by using the probability method or the Hunter's curve in the US, for example. I mean, okay, the water demand calculator now is different. The curve for hotels is the one where the highest simultaneous use is expected, but in reality, there are different kinds of hotels. And it needs to be considered if the high simultaneous use is realistic for the hotel that is planned. Um, the high simultaneous use might be reached in hotels for exhibitions or conferences where the majority of the guests gets up at the same time and takes a shower and go for breakfast afterwards. In a holiday hotel resorts, uh, it is unlikely to have such high simultaneous use. Therefore, it makes sense 
to speak to the client about the usage behavior of such projects and agree a realistic simultaneous use. That's where I mentioned this room book again. So that is then the most realistic scenario that you can take into account for the design. This can be done by yeah, the room book or, um, and useful basis for room book is given also in the D1988 part 200. The same difficulty as for hotels exists for hospitals. Um, the shown high simultaneous use can be found in a patient ward or physical rehab clinic, but the simultaneous use in a hospital kitchen, ICU or ambulance will be different. Therefore, it is mandatory to size hospitals with functions that reflect the simultaneous use of the different areas of the hospital. The curse for school uh, administration building and residential and elderly home are identical. The, this is most likely due to a lack of data to make further differences uh, for the curves of these different types of buildings. To generate more different simultaneous use functions for different buildings types and uh, even functional sections of them, more measurements and data is required. The simultaneous use for buildings with special purpose, um, such as individual industrial buildings, must be uh, discussed with the client separate. Next slide, please. Fixtures with constant consumption. Yes, that's also uh, another topic. Um, for example, um, a fixture of yeah, irrigation as here, the, there are fixtures who are de whose dezone flow rate is added to the calculated peak flow with 100%. Um, and a fixture is considered as a cons constant consumer when the normal use period of the fixture exceeds 15 minutes. So 15 minutes or longer, like irrigation. The designer has to clarify this with the client uh, if it is possible that the usage of the constant consumer comes together with the peak flow of the other fixtures. In this case, the design flow rate of the constant consumer must be added to the peak flow. So if you have um, a building where the constant consumer, the usage of the constant con consumer falls not into the peak period of the rest of the installation, it does not to be, uh, need to be considered. Next slide, please. The after calculation of the peak flow rate um, for all pipe sections, the av available pressure is calculated for all flow paths. The available pressure is the remaining pressure after deduction of the supply pressure at the beginning. Um, and you deduct it by the required minimum supply pressure of the fixture. So how much pressure do we need at the fixture? Geodetic, pre geodetic pressure loss and the pressure loss of the water meter and other components such as water heaters, for example. The main supply pressure is either given by the water supplier or it is the outlet pressure from the booster set. The main supply pressure, the minimum supply pressure of the fixture and the height are constant values and are given for the calculation. The selection of the pipe size Pipe system uh, of the of the pipe size, pipe system regarding fittings and other components are the variables to select correctly. So that are the factors we have to to um, yeah engineer. Next slide, please. The next step is the available pressure is pointed along the length of the flow path. Uh, after deduction of the pressure loss for the fittings. Um, this gradient, uh, this is the gradient A. This gradient gives information about how much pressure can be eaten up per meter pipe in each flow path. So that's this R available. In the differentiated can calculation method, it is required to calculate the pressure loss of fittings by use of so-called zeta values. This is um, a coefficient uh, that is given by manufacturers of pipe systems. But reference values for different types of fittings, such as elbows and T-pieces, are also given in the D1988. 
the dean values um, must be only used in a early stage of the project again because you might do not know what pipe system might be used and later on in a later stage you should use the the real um, zeta values from the manufacturer as they are much more precise and specific and that makes a big difference especially if you have multi-layer pipe fittings that go into the pipe and for a copper pipe system, you have a fitting that goes onto the pipe. So that's a major difference in the calculation. Next slide, please. And then the available pressure gradient is calculated for all flow paths. Um, this gradient gives information how about uh, how much pressure can be eaten up per meter pipe in each flow path, as I said. If the available pressure gradient is quite high, you get a slim system with small diameters and low water volume. The maximum allowed uh, velocity is then uh, the limiting factor for sizing the pipework, basically. If the available pressure gradient is relative low, uh, you get a system with bigger diameter, higher water volume, and slow velocities. Next slide. Yeah, let's have a look at um, this system. Knowing these two factors, the pipe sizing can be started. This uh, start with the index flow path, which is uh, the one with the lowest value for the available pressure drop per length of pipe. So um, yeah, most of the time the index run. The index run usually is the one on the top floor and ends with a fixture that requires the highest minimum supply pressure. So the minimum uh, pressure that you need to supply the design flow rate at this fixture. After sizing this flow path, it must be hydraulically uh, recalculated with the new real values. Sizing has to be done with respect to allowed maximum velocities. The D1988 part 300 allows up to five meters, which is about 16.6 feet per second, but only for sections with low pressure loss components like ball valves. Common velocity used uh, are uh, up to approximately 2.5 meter per second. This is similar to the ve velocity recommended in the national, uh, national standard plumbing code of the, that's the eight feet per second. But velocity does not have a sizing function, it's a limiting function. It's a limiting factor for, the, for our design. In contrast to pipe sizing based on velocity, where pipe sizes in, for example, um, this 45 apartment uh, residential building would be symmetric, sizing, sizing the pipes with regards to the available pressure gradient has the effect that the pipe sizes are not symmetric. Um, so let's have a look at the pipe sizes for the distribution pipes in the floors and the pipe sizes of the uh, apartment supply pipes on the next slide. The, here we only have a look here. Yeah, that's a very uh, simplified uh, schematic of our installation with the 45 apartments. So the size of the distribution pipes, the horizontal pipe. So on the left, you see I have a riser and then I have branches into each floor and each floor has nine apartments. So the horizontal pipe work in the different floors is uh, yeah, not symmetric. So the size of the distribution pipe that comes off the riser goes into the floor. They are getting bigger, the higher the floor. And the reduction of the pipe size in the separate floors appears further downstream from lower floors to upper floors. So you see in the red, there I have DN40, in orange, DN32, in yellow, DN25, and in green, DN20. And we can see in the, in the lower, in the ground floor, for example, we have the smaller pipe sizes, DN32, DN25, and DN20. And the further up I go, uh, the bigger the pipes and the longer the, the bigger part, the DN40 pipe remains, for example. And that is the effect of using this pressure gradient, um, using the available pressure uh, for pipe sizing. So in the lowest floor, uh, I, can, I can utilize more pressure per 
length of pipe than in the upper floors. Next slide, please. Um, looking, or if I then have a look at the um, supply pipes into the apartments, so that uh, are not the pipes that are shown here. So the apartments in the ground floor, first floor, and the first half of the second floor, they have a supply pipe of DN20. And uh, further, um, yeah, higher in the building and the second half of the second floor, we have a DN25. So which is um, one inch pipe, for example. Even though the apartments are completely identical, they have the same bathroom, the same uh, kitchen, the same fixtures, the same geometry, everything. The supply pipe size can be different if you do the pipe sizing according to the D1988-300. Okay, next slide. So basically to summarize, um, Everything, the drinking water hygiene has a very high importance and the principle to achieve it is to design a slim system with low water content to minimize water age in the system. Minimizing the water age um, also has positive effect on maintaining required water temperatures in the installation. Creating a reasonably branched system shall keep the installation simple. Um, yeah, where technically not beneficial, branches uh, shall be avoided. So only the differentiated calculation, calculation method must be used. Um, also with regards to pipe sizing calculations in 3D models for BIM, the use of the differentiated method is a must. Because if you have a computer, you can do the differentiated method anyway, because you are having a lot of IT power. The use of manufacturer specific data is required to get uh, reliable and accurate calculation results. This is also required for future design calculations also in 3D models for BIM again, as the request for accurate calculation increases. The major factor for pipe sizing according to D1988-300 uh, are the peak flow rate and the available pressure gradient. As the last point, and the next slide, please. Yeah, that is how you size your supply pipes. And uh, as I said, the European standard only contains the water supply pipe sizing, not the return pipe sizing and hydraulic balancing. And therefore, that is then 50% of the work you have to do for your plumbing uh, design. And that's, I think, all I have to say for yeah, this morning, this afternoon, this night, <laughs> wherever you are. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Frank. It's a really interesting approach, uh, having my, my expertise being Australian, um, to see the real difference in approach from some of the European concepts and the, the different way of, of formulating that information and passing on to the designer to use. So, um, yeah, really fascinating uh, presentation, Frank, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so lastly, I'd like to introduce Russ Wakefield. Uh, Russ works for the New Zealand government as a senior advisor for plumbing and hydraulic services uh, within the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, or MB for short. Uh, working within MB's building performance and engineering team, his focus is on developing and maintaining parts of the New Zealand building code system, which support the plumbing and drainage work. Russ is trained as a plumber gas fitter drain leader in the Royal New Zealand Army Engineers. And since... Uh, packing up his tools, he's worked as a plumbing and drainage inspector, uh, industry training assessor, and hydraulic service design consultant. Uh, Russ is also a voting member of the ICC's 815 committee. And uh, Russ is going to provide us with an overview of the New Zealand building code, the plumbing uh, and drainage design standards in New Zealand and Australia, um, which the two countries jointly share. Uh, along with an overview of the pipe sizing research conducted in New Zealand. So thanks for joining us, Russ, and I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom, and thanks to the ICC for the opportunity to um, join today and present. Yes, yeah, so as Tom mentioned, I'm Ross um, and work uh, as a senior advisor for the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, um, which is a public service department of the New Zealand government. Um, 
And a key part of my role uh, within MB is to develop and improve the parts of the building code which support plumbing and drainage work across New Zealand. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So in New Zealand, building works regulated to ensure buildings are safe, healthy and durable. Um, and the building code is a key part of the regulatory system here. Similar to the Australian building code that Tom Wise touched on, um, our building code in New Zealand is a performance-based code and it sets the minimum requirements that um, building work must meet. And all plumbing and other building systems are required to meet the performance requirements set out in the building code. And we regularly update the building code documents, including those which support the plumbing sector to keep up to date with uh, innovation and changes. Next slide, please, Tom. Yeah, so our building code in New Zealand sets clear expectations of the standards buildings should meet. Uh, being performance-based, this means the code only states how a building must perform rather than describing how it must be designed and constructed at the code level. And by focusing on how buildings perform rather than how they are built, designers and architects and builders can meet the building standards in flexible and innovative ways. Now, the building code covers aspects such as structural stability, durability, protection from fire, access, moisture control, services and facilities, energy efficiency, along with plumbing and drainage systems. Um, and we have underneath the, um, the performance-based building code, we have a number of compliance pathways that people can choose to use. Uh, they include verification methods or acceptable solutions. Uh, some of those documents are shown on the screen at the moment. Um, and these are deemed to comply solutions, uh, which are the easiest ways to ensure the building will meet these performance requirements that are set out in the building code. There's also the opportunity to do alternative solutions, which are a flexible option that promotes innovation and allow the use of alternative methods and innovative design approaches, um, provided it can be shown to comply with the performance requirements of the building code. Next slide, please, Tom. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Uh, standards play a key role um, in demonstrating compliance with the building code in New Zealand and ensuring that plumbing work complies with the New Zealand building code. Uh, the Australian New Zealand Plumbing and Drainage Standards, uh, which are referred to as the AS NZS 3500 series, are a key series of standards which have been used in the design and installation of plumbing and drainage systems, both in Australia and New Zealand for the past 30 years. Now, part one of this series um, is about water services and is currently referenced in the New Zealand Building Code as a means of sizing water supply pipe work to comply with the building code requirements. Now, the standard provides a loading unit method for the calculation of probable simultaneous flow rates and the sizing of water supply pipe work in single and multi-residential buildings. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So the standard I mentioned that's currently referenced, um, the Australian New Zealand Standard 3500 Part 1, uh, that's referenced for sizing water supply pipe work to comply with the New Zealand Building Code. Um, and we made a, a decision to review uh, the verification method that referenced this for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the method for sizing water services within the standard is limited to residential buildings only. And in New Zealand, there wasn't a currently a deemed to comply pathway for sizing water services and other building types. And international research um, of the likes that uh, Tom Wise mentioned in his presentation um, indicated that the loading unit sizing methods um, within that standard can result in significant overestimation of design flow rates. Uh, so we look to undertake some research to identify suitable international um, standards used for sizing water services pipe work um, that could be considered for adoption as a verification method for sizing pipe work to comply with the New Zealand Building Code. The intent being to see if we could identify a standard that we could propose um, to introduce as a new compliance pathway, which plumbing system designers could use to size water supply pipe work for different building types. Um, and it supports current hydraulic theory and reduces the risk of oversizing pipe work. So MB engaged um, Becker, which is one of Australia um, and the Asia Pacific's largest independent advisory and engineering consultancies to support us with this research. 
Uh, the work was led by Nick McIntosh with the support of Becker's Building Services team. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So as, as part of this research, um, we selected four international water supply pipe sizing methods um, for assessment and comparison against the current method within the Australia New Zealand Water Services standard. Uh, the methods we selected for comparison were the, the German standard, the DIN 1988-300 standard um, that Frank discussed in detail, and the British European standard, the BSEN 806 Part 3, um, as well as the US Uniform Plumbing Code uh, Appendix A um, pipe sizing method, as well as the Appendix M uh, method, which references the peak water demand calculator. And we also assessed the, the Plumbing Engineering Services Design Guide, which was initially published by the British Institute of Plumbing. And we compared these four against the, um, the method within the Australian New Zealand standard. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. So this graph shown on screen is from the research um, that shows a comparison of the plate flow rate diversity curves between the um, pipe sizing methods that we, we identified. Uh, the x-axis is based on fixture groups equivalent to a typical one bathroom apartment, so it roughly equates to one to 300 apartments along the x-axis, and the y-axis indicates the diversified flow rates. The labels on the right-hand side of the graph identify the diversity curves from the relevant sizing methods. So you can see there's quite a range of diversity curves, similar to the, um, the diversity curve graph shown in, uh, in the presentations earlier by Gary and uh, Tom Wise. Next slide, please, Tom. So based on the initial review of these selected international water supply sizing methods and assessment of the diversity curves, we selected two sizing methodologies for a more detailed comparative analysis against the Australian New Zealand standard. We looked in a bit more detail at the, um, the German DIN 1988-300 standard, as well as the um, Plumbing Engineering Services Design Guide or the IOP Guide from the UK. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. Yeah, so the researchers took, undertook a detailed comparison um, between these different pipe sizing methodologies um, in a comparison using three representative building types and an apartment building um, with 108 apartments and 18 levels, a hotel project with 324 rooms and 36 rooms per typical floor, um, and an office project with just six levels of open plan office with typical office fixtures, just to compare the results. Uh, Next slide, please, Tom. Now this slide just shows a comparison of the pipe sizes and the design flow rates that were calculated for the on-floor pipe work within the representative apartment building. Um, it gives an indication of the different sizes on floor and within the main rises. Uh, next slide, please, Tom. In this slide, um, shows some of the results and, and touches on a bit of the impact of the system architecture, which is um, the yellow and purple zones. Um, the, the yellow zones sort of corresponding with the on-floor pipe work and the, um, the, the purple zone corresponding with the mains or the riser pipe work, respectively. Um, and it sort of shows the, the relationship varies quite a bit with system architecture. and. Um, Buildings with the same numbers of floors, but more apartments per floor tend to have lower differences between some of these standards that we compared. Um, and a building with more floors has the same and with the same number of apartments per floor tend to have higher differences between the IOP and the DIN um, when we compared them. So yeah, it made quite a big difference depending on the particular layout of the buildings and the floors. Um, where there was more benefits with regards to um, pipe size reductions based on the flow rate calculations and corresponding costs and heat loss, um, energy usage reductions. Uh, next slide, please, Tom.
Yes, on, in summary, I mean, we found for this research that there was very different diversified flow rate calculation methods um, in the standards we reviewed. Um, and the German DIN standard typically resulted in larger pipe sizes at lower loadings and smaller pipe sizes at higher loadings when we were comparing them to the, um, the Australian New Zealand standard and the IAP guide. Um, Yeah, the Australian New Zealand standard resulted in the largest pipe sizes and typically one size larger than either of the other two standards throughout in the representative building comparisons that were done. Um, and both the, accordingly, both the uh, Institute of Plumbing Engineering Design Guide and the German DIN standard resulted in lower pipe costs and energy losses based on these buildings. And um, following this research um, and some further work that had been done in November last year, uh, MV published a building code update and we referenced the loading unit method of the plumbing engineering services design guide as a means of establishing maximum simultaneous flow rates for use in sizing hot and cold water supply systems, which now provides an alternative compliance pathway which plumbing services designers can choose to utilise in New Zealand. And our longer term intent being to support efforts to develop a contemporary method for sizing water services uh, that accounts for flow rates and probable simultaneous demands encountered in modern buildings, which includes supporting the ICC's um, 815 committee's project to develop a new standard for sizing water distribution, sanitary drainage and venting piping systems. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks, Russ. It's um, really interesting to see how, how many different regions have done that comparison and looked at other international standards for a solution. Uh, and a lot of, in a lot of cases come to the same outcomes that you know, we don't have all the answers just yet. Um, so I think yeah, it's quite, quite interesting to see that a lot of regions kind of have taken the same approach in, in first stage of uh, international comparison being the first go-to before trying to, to um, go, at it, go alone, do some research, see what is out there and, um, and then ultimately, you know, join a collective like the ICC's 815 co committee and, and work together towards this solution and bring a lot of this uh, research, uh, a lot of this expertise gathered to the table and, and sharing it. So thanks thanks for presenting, Ross, and thanks for uh, being involved. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So now, now to talk about the, the solution uh, we through that ICC's 815 standard. So the standard's got a product, uh, quite a broad scope uh, of what the issues that it's trying to address. Uh, it's covering everything from water service distribution, uh, water uh, sizing, <coughs> excuse me, uh, sanitary drainage and vent piping systems, uh, which is quite a broad scope. Um, but the benefit of, of considering all those different aspects in the one standard is, is those kind of flow and effects from the, the probability of fixtures being used, how much water is that likely to, to utilise and draw from and what's the peak demand, but also what's the impacts of that on the sanitary side of things. And considering those systems holistically will ensure that there's no unintended consequences of, of any outcomes that the standard might publish. So we've mentioned the ICC's 815 committee in, uh, a few times and, and the standard as, as the uh, objective and the solution. Um, so I think I, I'll use this opportunity to kind of bring all those pieces of the puzzle together that the other presenters have, have talked through this uh, today. Um, we uh, are taking a bit of a unique uh, pathway to developing this standard. So not only are we uh, convening a committee full of global expertise from different regions around the world, but we're also uh, driven by academic research. So we've partnered with universities uh, to achieve this outcome because some, and as you've seen from some of the presentations already, uh, some research has been done and it's a fantastic piece of the puzzle, uh, but now it's time to bring all those pieces together and see what's left to do and how we can make that happen. Uh, we're doing that through partnering with the University of Miami, uh, and they're going to be the, the central agency working uh, academically and solving this problem. Uh, but that's not to say that we're not working with other academic institutions all over the world. So we're, we're drawing on the expertise of, of that research and those research bodies uh, and collaborating internationally, both in the engineering and the committee uh, space, but also in the academic space as well. 
Um, and I, I just wanted to highlight that, that that international collaboration is is what we see as being essential to solving this problem because it is quite a, a large problem and a lot of um, a lot of engineers and a lot of academics have already been working on this for such a significant amount of time. So to give an idea of the objectives of the new ISS 815 standard, so public health and safety is always at the heart of, of most plumbing related standards. Um, it's kind of the essential uh, objective of anything to do for plumbing. Um, but it being a, a global product presents uh, a few advantages in its development by being able to tap into international expertise, um, international, international academic work, um, and bring all that all to the table. Uh, it's also going to be a living document, which is a little bit different to a standard where it might have a, a revision cycle uh, or it might just sit on the shelf and that, that provides the solution for a long period of time. The objective of this standard is to be a living document. It will continually grow as more data becomes available, more research is done, and more information can inform future editions of the standard. Um, the, another area that the standard seeks to achieve is the ability to adapt. So being a global standard, water usage behaviors is quite significantly different in different regions and for many different uh, reasons. So having a global objective to the standard, all those kind of key considerations and how the standard might adapt to different communities and different regions needs to be worked through in that development process. Sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? There's a lot of high level objectives in, in that we're trying to achieve with this standard and it does make it quite a unique project. So how we plan to get there is through a number of different phases of research and development. Uh, the first thing I'll point out is that committee feedback through the ISSS 815 committee is going to be essential at each of those key stages and really steer the ship and where both the research goes as well as the standards development goes. Um, yeah, but the University of Miami in particular has been working through understanding the problem, the engineering principles, and the approaches that are already in existence. So we've already seen today that there's been a number of different uh, opportunities to review international standards and have that kind of comparison to how they perform, especially in comparison to uh, any sort of data that might inform what's happening in reality, not just what uh, different standards and codes are predicting or estimating. Um, through that, the discovery phase. So the discovery phase is a deep dive into some of these issues. As I mentioned, there's already some fantastic research that's already been done, but there's also research that still needs to be done to fill in some of those gaps in that big jigsaw puzzle. Okay. So the creation phase will focus on uh, these variables and start to model what that solution may look like. Uh, through that process, it will be strengthened and adapted uh, through the strengthening and fine tuning phases of development. Uh, and then a final product to be developed as a standard uh, alongside, uh, which I predict, many research papers and many uh, interesting research findings that we may come through throughout this process. Uh, I mentioned before, all, all the way through this journey, the standard uh, committee, the 815 committee, will guide, uh, guide the research and guide the standards development throughout this process and are really a core, uh, core part of this work because we can tap into that experience in existing research that's already happened, but also in terms of uh, engineering principles that might be applied across different regions. It's not a, not, a, not a problem that we can solve on our own and that we have the ability to tap into that global expertise. So I'm hoping I've sold, sold everyone attending on uh, importance of the work. Uh, the ability to collaborate internationally and draw on that expertise and that um, subject matter knowledge, uh, as well as knowledge of the academic research that's happened in different regions. So if this is interesting to you, I would really encourage you to reach out to our standards development manager, Ramiro, or myself, and get in touch, talk to us about what your experience is in your different regions, uh, and we'll work with you on how we can kind of tap into that and work work with you towards this, this objective and this solution, which is the 815 standard. Uh, thank you to everyone that's joined us. Uh, it's been a fantastic opportunity to showcase some of the expertise on our uh, working groups and our committees 
uh, as well as research that's happening internationally. Uh, and I hope you gained a lot from it. Um, thank you again for joining us. Uh, I'll bring up the QR codes for uh, CPD points uh, in a second. Um, and I just wanted to, to give the opportunity to all the presenters to just thank everyone for attending. So feel free to turn your camera back on and just say a quick thank you and goodbye. Thank you, Tom. This has been very exciting to listen to the perspectives. Um, so most all of us on this call have chatted more than once over the last couple of years, but it's fascinating to hear where we've come even in just such a short period of time. Um, I think that international collaboration is the way to go here. Um, there's a lot of pieces to the puzzle, but I would observe that the physics is the same and the plumbing can't read, so it doesn't know what building it's in or what country it's in. Fundamental rules ought to be the same everywhere. Thank you. Well said, Gary. Thanks, Tom. I appreciated uh, the opportunity tonight and um, uh, echo Gary's points as well and look forward to a, um, a successful outcomes. Yep, thank you, Tom. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom, for organizing this event. Always interesting to uh, yeah, meet you guys, speak with you guys on an international basis. And I'm looking forward to yeah participate as much as I can. So yeah, looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank. Yeah, thanks, Tom. And thanks to the ICC for putting on tonight's event or today's event, depending on where you are. And thanks to everyone who dialed in for diving into an abundance of pipe sizing information. Hopefully everyone managed to take away some interesting pieces um, from tonight's discussion and looking forward to continuing um, supporting the work of the ICC 815 committee. Uh, thank you, Russ. Uh, so I've got on the screen the, the QR code so you, just to sign out and get any uh, CPD points for your organisation. Um, just a quick thank you again to all the presenters. We had uh, different people from different regions and different time zones. So um, always presents a challenge in presenting a, a webinar like this with a global aspect to it, but I think really worthwhile in, in putting together. And I hope everyone joining uh, gained a lot from it. Uh, thank you again from the ICC uh, and hope to see you again at another event like this soon.